welcome to the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast. This podcast focuses on financial planning and investment topics. Our goal is to help you make better financial decisions. We are fierce advocates of fiduciary advice. What does fiduciary mean? It means that anyone who advises you should always put your needs first. We hope you get some value from this episode. Thanks for listening. Standard housekeeping, anything on the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast should not be considered individual financial planning or investment advice. For that, we recommend you consult your own properly registered and licensed professional. Welcome back. This is episode 32 of the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast. I'm Brian Beasley, and with me again is Dan Alberth. Good afternoon, Dan. Good afternoon. Today, we're going to discuss a book titled Excess Returns, a Comparative Study of the Methods of the World's Greatest Investors by Frederick Van Haverbeek. Now, forgive me if I'm butchering his name. I'm going to preface this, and, and we've talked about this, Dan, is this book is primarily about studying the habits of some of the world's greatest stock-picking investors. So the book is primarily looking at picking individual stocks. Now, I want to, I want to emphasize Picking individual stocks, and I think as you go through this book, you may reach a similar conclusion. This is not something for the faint of heart, and this is certainly not something that we would recommend to the masses. And you'll understand where we're coming from, but I just want to preface this episode with that, I guess, bookend, if you will. And we'll talk a little bit more once we've covered the material. This may take several episodes because this is a meaty, meaty book. There are several entire chapters that were technical enough that we needed to not cover them over on a podcast episode, but there's so much good information and so much good guidance here from his study of some of the world's greatest investors that uh, we couldn't help but not cover some of this material for you. So let's just get right into it in the introduction. He begins here with a quote. The main reason why money is lost in stock speculation is not because Wall Street is dishonest, but because so many people persist in thinking that you can make money without working for it, and that the stock exchange is the place where this miracle can be performed. And that is a quote from a gentleman named Bernard Baruch. Back to the book here. He starts off, The fact that few people are able to beat the market is one of the reasons certain academics have posited the idea that markets are so efficient that they can only be beaten through luck. These proponents of the so-called efficient market hypothesis argue that investors cannot take advantage of price anomalies as every anomaly is eliminated instantaneously by the many smart people that look for bargains in the market. To verify the claim that the market can be beaten by means of certain styles, I show the annual compound returns of a number of famous market operators with track records of at least 10 years. And in the book, what he has is he has a list of 20 or 30 of some of the greatest names in investing, who each of whom had, he has their name, their track record, the length of that track track record, what their average return was, and it gives you an idea of some of these key investors over history. And he continues, the theory that these people were all lucky falls short. First of all, it was not home runs and leverage that drove these returns. Virtually all of these returns were achieved through diversified portfolios, with significant turnover. That means they're buying and selling a lot across periods ranging from 10 to almost 50 years. Although some of the market operators were leveraged, many weren't. And leverage just means they're they're borrowing, they're using borrowed money to invest. Besides, none of those who were leveraged owed their excellent track records to a single lucky strike. In fact, futures traders like Richard Dennis and William Eckhart probably made hundreds or thousands of trades throughout the considered period. Second, many of the returns actually understate what these investors or traders could achieve. Various returns shown here are after the subtraction of sizable management fees and expenses, so the return before these fees was even greater. Further, some returns were achieved 
and portfolios that were so large that the market operator's freedom of action and flexibility were seriously impeded. And what he, I'm a sidebar here. What he's talking about is that once a fund or portfolio becomes a certain size, it becomes harder to only invest in your top picks simply because your position might be too, so large that you could actually move the price of that asset if it's small enough, or if, especially if you're dealing with a smaller company, you might end up having to buy the whole company three times over and you simply can't, you can't buy enough shares to really get what you want out of it because the your fidelity, portfolio is too big. The Fidelity Fund back in the 1980s started out as a smaller fund with individual holdings and it grew so large that yeah. they had such a hard time finding those stocks that it actually turned into a pseudo uh, S&P 500 fund because it, it was it the, the Fidelity Magellan fund yes from Peter, and Peter Lynch's name is listed right here on one of those as one of those examples in in the book exactly back to the book one has to realize that selling and purchasing shares cannot be done as swiftly in large portfolios and as in small ones in addition, large portfolios also restrict the universe in which a portfolio manager can look for a trade since smart portfolio managers don't spend their precious research time on stocks that cannot move the needle of their portfolio. This adds up to mean that these people could not always necessarily act on their best ideas, thus impeding their performance. A third problem for people who attribute success in the stock market to chance is that some of the returns were achieved consistently and with very low volatility. The most striking example of consistency is Edward Thorpe, who posted gains in 98.7 of the months that he ran an investment partnership between 1969 and 1988. So it was 230 months that his hedge fund ran. It was a... 98.7%? Yeah, so it were 230 months... In 227 of those 230 months, he had a positive return in his in his fund. Wow. Now, granted, he was one of the first people to try to do what he was doing, so comp obviously competition showed up. But that's still a commend it's it's still a commendable thing. When looking at all these people, he continues in the book: these excess returns tend to decrease when the observation period gets longer. The longer somebody's investing their fund, the more the less their excess return tends to be. People who've been investing their funds for 40 years or 50 years tend to start getting very, very close to what the rest of the market is. People who had a track record where they were knocking the lights out doing in 50% a year or something, their track records might have lasted a decade or 15 years, but then over time, they, they even there, even with these great investors, they tended to compress over time is what he's talking about. Nevertheless, even over periods of about half a century, some investors managed to maintain an excess return of more than 5%. And, and truthfully, if you're getting market plus 5% on average per year, that's pretty rare error. That's that's phenomenal. Even if it's it doesn't have to be fifty percent, it can be just market plus something better than five, and you're all, you're a legend. It's a really hard job. So back to the book. The most astonishing track record is undoubtedly that of Warren Buffett, who managed to beat the market by an amazing twenty percent per year over a period of fifty four years. Now that sounds awesome, but we went back and looked at the math and what we what we noticed is exactly what they were talking about. As Berkshire Hathaway got very, very, very large, his excess return became much, much smaller. And so there was a period where his excess return was way, way more than 20% per year. And then as his fun, as his, his pile just got so big, he couldn't really deliver that excess that he wanted because he just had to put all that money to work. This book focuses exclusively on the quantitative, math-oriented, and quantitative-qualitative, which is a combination of mathematics and judgment, investment styles. The aim is to give a comprehensive review of the practices applied by the most successful practitioners of these styles. It is very different from other investment books about or written by famous investors, as this compiles information from numerous top investors found in hundreds of books, interviews, articles, letters to shareholders and investors, and so on. Also, a recurring theme throughout the book is that beating the market requires effort, focus, and discipline. 
Success in the stock market can be achieved by devoted people who are willing to put in sufficient time and effort and who adhere to a number of guidelines. On the other hand, people who take shortcuts, people who can't or don't want to spend much time on their market activities, or people who can't develop the required attitudes and behavior stand little chance in the stock market. Folks, this stuff takes work. This is not something you're going to do in five minutes while you're waiting in line somewhere on your phone. You need to be t taking this stuff very, very seriously if you're going to try to succeed in picking stocks. The people he's describing in this book did this full time. Many, many cases, they have teams of people helping them full time. This is not for the faint of heart if you're trying to do it. And even then, it's challenging. So just take that with a grain of salt. So he continues on talking about investment philosophy and styles. It is extraordinary to me that the idea of buying dollar bills for 40 cents takes immediately to people or it doesn't take at all. It's like an inoculation. If it doesn't grab a person right away, I find that you can talk to them for years and show him records and it doesn't make any difference. They just don't seem to able to grasp the concept as simple as it is. That's from Warren Buffett himself. So how does he describe what he's doing? He says, I buy dollar bills for 40 cents. Either get that or you don't. So the book continues. Beating the market is not easy. Smart market players realize they need a well-articulated strategy based on a sound market philosophy to obtain an edge. So if you can build your strategy around a certain philosophy, what's the philosophy look like? And he talks about the investment philosophy. So there's a lot of vocabulary in the investment world. And you've got, you've got investors, you've got traders. Sometimes people get confused with what all these things mean. And as he's talking about the investment philosophy, he's talking about the philosophy associated with these particular top investors. So he's not saying there's only one investment philosophy in the world. He's just, he just calls it that in this book as you have to have something to hang your hat on about how you think the world works. In general, a market philosophy describes the drivers behind the stock market and explains how these drivers create pricing inefficiencies. The investment philosophy, which is the market philosophy of investors, and when he says of investors, he's talking about these top investors, people like these guys, these, these people that are in the book. The investment philosophy, which is the philosophy of investors and which is the focus of our attention here, has as a basic premise that even though price fluctuations are unpredictable over the short run, stock prices constantly fluctuate around their fair value. Investors refer to this fair value as the stock's intrinsic value. Investors attempt to beat the market by purchasing stocks that are trading below their intrinsic values and then try to sell them once they are trading close to or above their intrinsic values. The true challenge for investors is how to determine that intrinsic value. And we get questions online all the time. You come up on our investing for beginners group how do i calculate intrinsic value of a company and there you know people are looking for the formula and there's there's no magic formula it's challenging and it, every there's a lot of managers that do it slightly differently from one another and have different opinions and different philosophies of even how that is some people may say I think it's worth more because of something that's going to happen with that company down the line and it may not be on paper Maybe that's a growth manager. I think that this is the future and I'm going to go ahead and buy this because I believe the intrinsic value of this business is not even on the paper yet. And there's other people more like Warren Buffett, value investors who are going to say, I'm only going to go with what's on paper. And it's possible they can evaluate the intrinsic value using multiple different ways to try to get a true sense for that's it. That's right. Because no one way may be actually perfect. And I, like our, our partner, Tom, who's been on the podcast, you know, he, he's gone through the, the, the charter financial analyst education and is still in the process of that. And uh, you know, there's lots of ways to do the, to measure those things. 
but there's other things that make this a little bit more difficult. And one of the things the author dives into here is the idea of cognitive biases. So this goes to how did these people, where do these inefficiencies in the market come from? And he spends a fair amount of time on these biases. There's, there's a few of them here. We're going to go through just a handful. But as we're talking about these things, I, I was going through and thinking, oh, where am I susceptible to these things? Where have I seen these things in others? And you know, studies show it, you, you always, it's easier to identify someone else's bias than to, to identify your own. I'm going to go through these just to give folks an idea of, or maybe that opportunity to exercise their brain a little bit and say, where might you have seen these kinds of biases come up in your discussions with others or even in your own financial planning or investing? So he, he talks about them here a little bit. People tend to make a number of systematic psychological errors, which are referred to as cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are the source of many investment mistakes. The most important cognitive biases that tend to drive irrational market behavior are as follows. And we're not going to go through them all because there were too many to cover, but we'll go through a handful here. First, pattern and trend seeking. The human brain is wired to look everywhere for patterns and trends, even in noise. For instance, many people discover trends when they stare long enough at stock charts, only to find out later that they can't make money on these observations. This pattern-seeking bias is supported by the law of small numbers, which states that people tend to derive patterns and trends from statistically insignificant samples. When a mutual fund manager outperforms his benchmark two years in a row, for example, he is believed to be a genius, even though this performance is statistically not that significant. I've seen that over and over again with people, especially when the markets are have been raging in one direction or another for a period of time, usually at extremes, at market bottoms, at big inflection points when things are radically changing. That's when people come out of the woodwork focused on pattern recognition and drawing lines on charts and things. And there has been no substantive proof that any of that has any durable correlation to future results. But on the other side, some people will say, well, yeah, but even though it's irrational, if enough people do it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So why not play that game? And this is why trends develop. This is why things happen the way they do sometimes. But be aware If you're looking, if you're seeing patterns in things, maybe that pattern might just be a small sample set. You may have no indication that that's going to be predictive in any way. So you'll be very, very careful about pattern and trend seeking. Another one is overconfidence and the illusion of control. People tend to have too much confidence in their own abilities. A nice example is that the vast majority of people believe that their driving skills are above average, which of course is impossible. In the stock market, overconfidence and the illusion control can lead to errors. The belief that one can be successful without the proper skills, expertise, and effort. Trading too much, as it is believed to be easy to time one's trades. Poor feedback from mistakes, as mistakes are not recognized as such by overconfident people. And inadequate risk management. Well, I have to say, I've seen all of that in the last 18 months of interacting with people online who've been investing their own money. And the thing is, they've been rewarded for it so far. There's going to be anecdotes where somebody did all of it wrong on the front end and they still were rewarded and they still were able to manage their risk and luck out. And they're, that's going to be their statistical story or the anecdote about why this is all a, a load of BS, which it might be. Herding behavior. People feel comfortable when they follow the crowd, especially when they are confronted with a vague and complex problem about which they feel insecure. It needs little explanation that blindly following the crowd is a recipe for disaster. It leads to heavy selling near the bottom of bear markets and heavy buying close to the tops of bull markets, all in imitation of other people. Chasing popular stocks irrespective of price, and steering clear of unpopular and ignored stocks, even if they are attractively valued. And what's been going on in the last year? The the phrase to the moon has entered our vocabulary, at least in the investment world. Many, many people saying, hey, 
the numbers don't matter. We're all buying. Therefore, this is going to go to the moon. And they're just gambling. As you've said many, many times over, you're just gambling. That's not investing. It's just herd behavior. Another one is a little bit more, sounds a little more academic, biased information filtering. When confronted with a lot of information, people tend to focus on just a few pieces of that information. People are inclined to overweight information that is most recent. People pay more attention to information when it is more emotionally charged. And this biased information filtering leads to extrapolation of recent trends, especially when those trends are emotionally charged. So an example of that is it's doing so well or it's doing poorly. My account's gone down, down, down. So now I want to get out because it's going to keep going down, down, down. They're being selectively biased in their filtering of their information. Likewise, you have people who can look at the last one, three, five years of pick your sector and look, it's been going up, up, up. Therefore, it's going to keep going up, up, up. And that's what this filtering can do. But it can also lead to poor feedback from your past experiences as only, only the most impressionable experiences are kept in your memory. So for example, let's say you didn't have a lot of money in the 2008 crisis. Maybe your job was fine through that period. Maybe you didn't experience a huge amount of uh, discomfort through that global financial crisis from 2007 to 2009. Maybe you had no money to invest because you were just getting out of school at that time. And if that's the case, it's not that meaningful to you that the world financial system literally almost collapsed. It took huge efforts to just to preserve society back then. It was a huge, huge thing. It could also lead to investment decisions that are based on superficial information from appealing stories without doing any homework. Hey, that sounds like a great story. It sounds like it's the future. Let's go ahead and buy it. Well, that may work out, but it can't be. It's not something you can turn into a system. Another bias is framing. Information is more likely to appeal to people when it's framed in an attractive way. For example, a service offered for a dollar a day seems much more attractive than the same service at $365 per year, although both are equally expensive. Anchoring. I see this one a lot just because people don't want to go through the headache of doing percentage math. When people make a judgment about something, they are apt to build their perspective starting from a piece of information that may be totally irrelevant to the problem. Due to anchoring, investors make the following mistakes. They use the price at which they purchased a stock as an anchor and therefore hang on to losing positions as they refuse to sell below their purchase price. I just can't sell at a loss. I can't do it. Or they think that it's got to come back to where I bought it. It always comes. It, it, these things always come back. They come back to what? To the anchor? Well, the anchor shouldn't be something arbitrary is what he's saying here. They might sell a winner too soon as it moves above the purchase price. And they, they believe that the stock is cheap or expensive based on a comparison with its historical stock prices. So yeah, you don't want to anchor to some price that you came up with. The anchor is always the intrinsic value of the business, whatever that may be. Now that's hard to know, but that's the actual anchor. So the price is going to think of a rubber band. If it's anchor, one end of the rubber band is anchored to something the price is the other end of the rubber band. It's going to bounce around and stretch one way, or next, but it always wants to come back to the anchor point, the intrinsic value. But when you don't even tie the end of the rubber band to the right place, you're setting yourself up for some mistakes. There's biases caused by sympathy or familiarity. People are favorably disposed toward things related to something like something they like. This is the sympathy bias and the halo effect or to something they're familiar with. That's called a home bias. Applied to investing, many people take a liking to companies they are familiar with, companies they feel sympathy for, or stocks about which there exists a fascinating story. This is the so-called narrative fallacy. Therefore, an investor's typical short list of purchase candidates consists of companies headquartered close to home or even the company they work at, Companies with nice, easy, pronounceable, and or familiar names. Companies with excellent products. Companies that are often in the media. 
or even companies that have accidental similarities with the investor. For example, when the stock ticker is the same as one's initials or when the company's logo has the same color as one's eyes. I didn't, never thought of it that way. Never thought of, never met somebody that did it that purposefully that, oh, I, I like that because it's the same color as my eyes. But I can imagine that could even happen subliminally at some level. If you do this, I can see how the, your due diligence process is very emotionally based. There's literally no math. You're investing in companies that make you feel good or you think they have good products or they're close by. So I want to support the company that's in my neighborhood. And it's what he was talking about in the beginning. People who are trying to look for the shortcuts usually have a tough time. And the shortcut is, I don't want to do that homework. I don't want to do the math. I don't want to do the research. I don't have time. I'm busy. It's not that you're lazy. It's just that you literally may just not have the time. It's not a big enough priority to take over the full time of your of your day-to-day life. But an- another thing along those lines of sympathy and familiarity is people trust their friends and relatives and their neighbors. And we've talked about this before, but people trust their friends and relatives more than they trust sometimes people who are competent experts at what they're talking about simply because they trust those people. They'll trust an incompetent person that's trustworthy, <laughs> that, they, that they're familiar with. And oftentimes they'll copycat what that person will do not knowing if that person knows what they're doing. They might have had some recent success, but then what are you doing? You're just chasing what recently happened and seeing patterns where they don't exist. And finally, there's thirst for excitement, just pure thirst for excitement. And uh, I got to say, when we saw the casinos shut down during COVID, the amount of gambling we saw happening in on social media related to inv- the investing world was uh, uh, shocking to say the least. I mean, but basically anybody that couldn't gamble found a place to gamble in the stock market. Even now in mid 2021, when we're recording this, there's still a little bit of that out there. But he says here, people chase the most exciting stocks of the day, the latest hot IPO, for example. And some people pursue inferior, but exciting investment strategies. Quote, there's nothing new on Wall Street or in stock speculation. What has happened in the past will happen again and again and again. This is because human nature does not change. And it is human emotion that always gets in the way of human intelligence. Quote from Jesse Livermore. So cognitive biases are the source of many investment mistakes, such as there's some of the reasons why investors don't perform due diligence. They prompt investors to hang on to losing stocks or sell winning stocks too early against their better judgment. Cognitive biases can be the source of irrational ideas about the intrinsic value of stocks. All this comes down to decision making and judgment, and it's and not being easy. aware. Yeah, I mean, it's being aware of these things and being aware of these weaknesses that are in each are in each of us. And if we're aware of it, then maybe we can shut down those emotions in order to get to the root math and really figure out what's a good investment opportunity. Or at least be aware enough to build your process in a way that if you follow that process, you can reduce the the influence that these biases may have for sure. Back to the book here. Investors argue that these types of systematic errors cause price inefficiencies that can be taken advantage of. So all this long-winded stuff about psychology, he's, he's just circling right back to, and because of all these things that can go wrong in our brains, that creates inefficiencies in the marketplace. People aren't perfectly rational. Therefore, they make mistakes. Therefore, prices don't always reflect perfection. And that is where these investors he's talking about in this book find opportunity. There's a quote here from David Draymond. People are captivated by exciting new concepts. The lure of hitting a home run on a hot new idea overwhelms caution. The sizzle and glitz of an IPO is just too great. That's David Draymond. And he's right. We're seeing it right now. Now, people get very, very excited sometimes about something that just moved a lot or that has a great story. And those stories aren't over yet, but that certainly does. There's no guarantee that they're just beginning. They may fizzle. We saw that in the dot-com era, the dot-com book that we covered in prior our prior episode. 
there were a lot of really hot companies that ended up, they're not even around anymore. It happens. So inefficiencies caused by popularity or the lack thereof are the bread and butter of many of the purest value investment styles. Benjamin Graham taught his students that stocks in the doghouse which typically can be recognized by low valuation multiples, often offer above average returns, whereas hot glamour stocks of the moment are better avoided. Numerous studies have proved Benjamin Graham right. It's hard to do the math, and it's hard to ignore emotion. Along those lines, there are some required attitudes and mindset related to these great investors in this book. He continues on. Genuine investing is a major challenge that requires hard work expertise, experience, an appropriate mindset, and a high level of mental control. If any of these are absent, the investor's chances of success are rather slim. That sounds easy. Sounds simple. I bet it's not easy. You go through all those biases and we're all susceptible. And what's worse is it's very, very hard for us to self-diagnose where we're subject to those same biases. We don't notice our own biases. It's take someone else from the outside looking in sometimes to say, excuse me, you're falling prey to... It requires humility on the part of the investor. Exactly. So let's continue on. First of all, to be a successful investor, they must be better at estimating the fair value of companies than the market. So he's starting off with this one. Like, hey, no big deal. But the first thing you got to do is you got to be able to evaluate how much is that company worth and you got to do a better job than the overall market does. If you can check that box off, then you're on the starting line. But that's a heck of a challenge. I mean, I, I can't say that I can analyze a business any better than the overall market, but that's the first thing he mentions. So how do they do this? Well, to make this happen, they need unique information that gives them an edge over the other market participants. This kind of exclusive information cannot be acquired from others, but requires hard work. Furthermore, although there are successful investors from all kinds of professional backgrounds, estimating the fair value of business can only be done when one has the proper expertise to analyze those businesses. Many years of experience are, of course, helpful too. A second requirement is the right mindset. True investors are independent and patient. Independence, which entails questioning conventional wisdom and being critical of ideas that are unanimously accepted by the crowd, is necessary because little can be gained by following the herd. True investors are also patient because they know that it can take time before the market reflects a stock's true intrinsic value. Successful investors are not in a hurry and they stay disciplined when the markets behave irrationally. And I I guess this has been around for a long time, but beginning investors tend to be impatient. They tend to fall prey to all these mistakes because no one's ever told them that these things work. And in many cases, their time horizon is so short that I see people saying, hey, how can I make X percent per day? I want to invest this much money. And they don't even understand the math or the probabilities behind that math. Some of them, they're saying, hey, I want to make 1% a day. I mean, you're not going to quadruple your money every year. Even when they hire an investment advisor, they'll tell you right up front, hey, I'll give you six months to see how it goes. It's just too short term. You've got to evaluate process. We've told, talked about this over and over again. It's about the process and whether the process is good. The market's going to do what it's going to do, and it's a very noisy, chaotic place. It's not predictable in the short run. Last but not least, successful investors can detach themselves emotionally from the market. They have the courage to be contrarian and to go where other people feel uncomfortable. Their emotional detachment enables them to limit the impact of cognitive biases that get so many other investors in trouble. In sum, real investors are the true rational market participants that EMH adepts refer to. However, in contrast to the tenets of efficient market hypothesis, truly rational investors are scarce and they cannot keep the market in check. What he's done here in this first part is to lay out, hey, there are some people who have beaten the market 
consistently through discipline process over long periods of time. It has happened. So he's what he what he's bringing to us is this is possible. It has happened, and it wasn't by accident with these people. And he's bringing evidence to say, hey, here's what these people believe. These successful investors. He's not just coming up with this out of his own opinion. This is through deep research of people who've actually succeeded in beating the market for long periods of time. So this isn't opinion. This is a hypothesis based on evidence. And his evidence is this is possible. It's rare to beat the market, but it is possible. It's about process. It's about hard work. It's about discipline. And it's about wrestling with your own psychology so that you can make really, really good decisions better than other people. And getting that edge, it's challenging. He's laying out what it takes. And then in the next episodes, we're going to dive deeper. and He goes more into process. Once again, thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends. Please subscribe. Please like. Please comment. Please find us on social media. We are at Fierce Fiduciary. You can also Google Fierce Fiduciary Podcast and find us anywhere. Dan, you're at from Facebook. I'm on Facebook at Dan Alberth. Dan dot Alberth, and I am at Brian C Beasley on most platforms. We also participate in some Facebook groups. If you're looking to have a deeper conversation there about various things, there's a group called Investing for Beginners. And then Dan and I host a group called Investing and Financial Planning that provides some educational and learning material. So once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.